Yep. All right. Now we got it. All right. Ah, final, finalmente. It's crazy. We shouldn't have had any different setup from yesterday. So our yeah, our I was apologies. gonna say I, I thought usually when I opened it, it had all the same settings always popped up and everything just worked. <laughs> Okay, guys, thank you for your uh, patience with our sound problems. Um, we're going to go ahead and reintroduce the show and uh, and get us started again for everyone to enjoy. Um, this is our Foolish Tech show for Thursday. We do it at 4 p.m., obviously. You guys are here joining us. I'd like to welcome CompDoc, Katie, and Glenn back to our uh, table here. Um, today we wanted to start off briefly by a follow-up to some comments we made about a previous article, um, and that Where was... Where can they join us with... Oh, sorry, they can join us at uh, foolishtechshow.com or foolishit.com slash live. You can go to both of those places to get links to our RC channel. You can either open it up there or actually do it in a, a dedicated client and chat with us. Um, you can remain anonymous if you want, but we're here primarily to respond and to offer support for our products and services and to answer any questions you have about them. If you don't have uh, any of those things, we're going to go ahead and pick up some regular tech topics that we think are at least useful, if not interesting, to everyone out there. But please feel free to interrupt us. Um, and uh, is that it? Um, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so um, again, getting back to that story, and uh, everybody in the chat uh, hopefully can see my post on that. But basically, there's a town that was criticized uh, for its um, vote to not expand its solar farms, and they were they quoted a couple of residents as saying that it would. Um, prevent the uh, plants from growing, it would take away solar power from the plants to grow, and others that said basically it would uh, cause the sun to burn out quicker or otherwise take away its its energy. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of why those arguments are invalid, but um, this is not necessarily the uh, perception of the entire town. As it turns out, this town was voting on its That's fourth. not true. Social media and Reddit said it, that's the perception of the entire town. And the internet doesn't lie. Those well, are just politicians trying to repolitize. Well, I, I, I do believe that decisions. these uh, people did have a crash course in how social media works in this town. Uh, however, um, what it turned as it turns out that they, this is the fourth solar panel in, installation that they're putting in this town, and that they've approved them for all of the four uh, cardinal uh, directions, uh, apparently north, south, east, and west, and they were no, they uh, only approved them for in, three of them. They didn't well, they only approved them for three of them. They didn't approve them for the fourth, but that was the one. What was on the table, and the town just didn't want to be surrounded by this. It was an aesthetic argument primarily um, that they didn't want people, particularly in the corners, to have you know a yard. Man agrees. The internet doesn't lie. Well, at any rate, there's always two sides to every story, and I encourage everyone to continue to follow them. If everyone had just turned away from the story. If everyone turned away from the story the first uh, on this first post, all we would know about this town is that they had a, a bunch of backwater people who didn't know anything about science or solar power and were doing things that were harmful to or going to be potentially, you know, they weren't helping or standing back, holding back from environmental improvements. Well, That's obviously they do accurate. have a few. Yeah, so the, so you know, and which a lot was largely neglected to be mentioned in the original story. So, uh, you know, need to... those weren't the important parts. The important parts were they have people that think the sun is going to run out of energy. Because yeah, but a town that has two people who feel that way, and then ten thousand that don't, that's not representative necessarily of their entire population. And I just urge everyone out there to take these things. You know, with into consideration to to follow up on the stories and to get both sides, if at all possible, uh, before jumping to conclusions. It's all well and good and fun to 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 discuss how poorly they may be educated, but it is not representative of their town as a whole and shouldn't be taken as such. It's just that's a right, funny Glenn. Reason. It entertained us and gave us a laugh. Because that's what actually – it's not just that town. It's I don't want us to be laughing at their expense. At their expense. And there's probably some educated individuals. I, I think we limited it too much. It should just be applied to all of North Carolina. 
All of the U.S. actually. Well, North North Carolina is last in the U.S. virtually in education. Um, that's that's a fast. It did say in that follow up article though that North Carolina has one of the fastest growing uh, solar initiative states because right. of all the farmland area, but that's going to cause problems for future generations that are depending on that agriculture and that agriculture is not going to be there. It's going to be solar farms. Yeah. And apparently lettuce costs a lot of carbon emissions to produce. So all those uh, vegans out there who want us to all eat a lot more vegetables aren't considering the environmental impact of the carbon uh, necessary for uh, certain uh, vegetable production crop wise um, they it's a big picture it's complicated and it's not always as simple I don't as think the vegans really cared about carbon that wasn't their their okay. issue well whatever I, sorry whatever I uh, just but again well, you they're know, busy eating what sometimes food eat, so they're starving the animals sometimes just growing more vegetables isn't the uh, solution what either food you eats. Know, it's it, it's a big you have to take the big picture into consideration. That was my only point, folks. I don't want to hammer this subject topic anymore. That's all I wanted to say, and I'll let it let uh, who is Proctor's turn today. You can take it away. Yeah, well, I, I'm really glad that there was more to that story than than what we originally thought. I was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was really um, disappointed to hear that an entire town could could was that it uneducated. I, I do have uh, one other quick thing before we jump into Proctor's that was kind of interesting. Uh, Linux is known for being fairly stable, and there is actually a bug in Grub 2 that if you pressed a key 28 times, which they happen to press the backspace key 28 times, it would just allow you into the system. So it's another cautionary tale of you have to consider physical access as a end-all be-all to your computer security like most of us when we're thinking of computer security we're thinking of uh, of encryption and blocking things and uh, stopping people from getting through our firewalls and stuff like that, but we don't really take into consideration that someone breaks into the house, they potentially have access to your entire computer anyway, so you do need to have routes of securing that method as well. And even systems that are supposed to be renowned for security like Linux have these type of issues. So The good thing about open source, though, is apparently most of your big name uh, distro has already released a patch for it in a hurry and I'm sure that will spread very quickly so that's all I had on that one all right well today I wanted to talk about um, wireless networks uh, and specifically about extending the coverage of your wireless network uh, probably more in a commercial setting than in a in a home network. Um, and uh, me and Brantley talked about this earlier. And uh, one way one way to do it might be to to use a wireless uh, repeater or extender, which basically just uh, um, takes one wireless signal and rebroadcasts it to an area. That has a, a, a um, it's not getting a good signal, and that that would generally work pretty well on networks that um, you know, on small networks. Uh, but when you uh, get up into needing larger coverage areas with more users, um, a better approach to doing that would be to use uh, multiple access points. Um, Going to point you to a link. On dummies.com. Um, the way in which you're, you're going to want to do this is um, to, um, let me see, I can share my screen.
Can you see that, Brantley? Uh, hold on a sec. Yep. Okay. You look good? Yeah, it does. Hold on, let me try full screen. Yeah, it looks fine. Okay. Now, I don't know why. What I did, well, I just added another source. Oh, cool. Um, you're going to want to spread your different your, uh, your access points. Uh, you're going to use the same SSID um, with all of your access points, but you're going to use uh, different channels um, to um, to prevent uh, there any 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 interference by uh, your access points being on the same uh, the same channel. And you'll see in this uh, this uh, graphic here that um, you have three different access points and um, they're all on, on separate channels uh, to give a wider um, uh, coverage area in, in, this, in this room here. Um, a more advanced setup here it, with uh, more access points. Um, here you've got uh, one access point on channel one, one on 11 and two on six, but the two that are on six are far enough apart so that they don't intersect and interfere with each other. And, <clears throat> and with an even more advanced setup, you have um, two access points on channel one, and they're um, separated by um, an access point that's on channel six, but is its uh, um, coverage has been limited so that it doesn't interfere with the two outer channel six access points. And then in the middle, you have uh, one on channel 11. So basically, you want to try to separate all of your access point sections. Yeah, yeah, you want to make sure that none of the section, any of the no sections overlap that are using the same channel. That's that's always the difficult thing to me because you can't see wireless, so it's hard to know where overlaps really occur. And uh, the big discussion Proctor and I had was on, do we really agree with this channel theory? And uh, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. I, like I was saying, I don't really have a lot of experience in having set up multiple hardwired access points and in those cases it may be a good idea to have them on separate channels whereas in the case of having a wireless repeater it usually will just take that signal in the same channel and continue to use that throughout the repeated area so it's kind of a toss-up and interesting way to do it um, I would say definitely if you have it as different SSIDs and have solid LAN connections going into each access point, that you would want to have them on separate wireless channels for the least amount of interference. But I know in the case of repeaters, and especially in home places, that they're going to be on the same channel. So um, it's definitely interesting in ways to work around it. Um, I know Proctor, you'd said some stuff that I haven't even worked around or seen with the Cisco setups and the unifyings or what was that? Yeah, Cisco has a technology um, that they call um, single point setup. And basically it's some logic inside the their access points that um, ensure that the access points don't interfere with each other. Um, they would use the same SSID in different channels, but they, the access points are able to coordinate with each other to, to provide good service without uh, channel interference. And I'll post a link about that. And I know in my repeater section, I had something called roaming assistance, I believe it is, that basically allowed me to set a lowest level that people can connect to, to that access point. 
and then if it gets below that, it's going to disconnect it so that hopefully it will connect to the repeater that it may be closer to at that time. That's weird. I'm hearing echo. Is anybody else hearing me echo? I'm not getting one. Test. Oh, maybe it's just me. Test. Yeah, I don't hear an echo from you. I just hear an echo from me. Hmm. And Glenn mentions also using directional aerials, which that, yeah, that's something else we didn't talk about is you can have directional antennas so that you can have uh, Glenn tested in the IRC. We can hear you good there. Um, <laughs> having directional antennas might also be another route because you're taking that signal and focusing it in a specific area like you can have the panels that will force it all one direction or you can even have the uh, yogi adapters I think they're called which I have one here uh, where did I put that thing Yeah, so you have the panel ones, which, so basically, right, you have a, a wireless antenna, and what this does is it broadcasts in a bubble all around, omnidirectional, so everywhere it's broadcasting out. You also have panels where the panel will force all the Wi-Fi to go forward, so that would be where you'd put it on the wall and then it would face out towards that way. And then you have things like this, which is a Yogi adapter. And with that, it actually takes it and forces the stream forward to a singular point. But I mean, it's not obviously like a singular point here. It's way out extended, but it V lines your directional signal using a setup like that. So. The directional routes are definitely good, especially if, like, you're trying to extend Wi-Fi to a, um, like, a distant, uh, like, say, if you have a workshop set off and about, that would be a good use of a directional antenna so that you can point your repeater towards that or your access point antenna towards that uh, workshop and then have a repeater with another directional antenna pointed towards it as well so that they're both pointing and just focusing their Wi-Fi. So like a, just a point-to-point -point connection? Yeah. Um, this link here was just something I found interesting while I was looking up information on Cisco's site. It's a... Um, emulator for all of their or, or for a lot of their um, wireless access points and the routers so you can play around with their firmware without actually having having to have the device I thought it was pretty cool um, you were uh, talking earlier um, Brantley about not knowing exactly where your wireless network extends uh -huh. um, just posted a link um, with a software a heat mapping software where you can actually it'll actually show you um, like a heat signature of where the wireless extends have you seen anything like that before um, hold on let me pull up that link I actually had a another now that you mentioned that emulator site um, I actually had a emulator site that I used before that let you see all the logins, which is extremely helpful for remote situations. I'm trying to see if I can find that. I'll check out your link as well here. Yeah, well, this uh, um, heat mapper software um, will can show you visually um, what your Wi-Fi coverage coverage is, where it's uh, you have a, a strong signal, a weak signal, or no signal at all. Oh, that is interesting. 
Um, that's kind of like that's w what I do with mine uh, in my place and anywhere I'm trying to gauge wireless signal is the Wi-Fi analyzer app. It's been around for a long, long time, and I really like it because it gives you a few options. Plus, it shows you the uh, how it's a hump on signal. So, like when you select a channel, it's not just selecting that one channel; you're actually selecting that range of channels. But you can see the other wireless in the area. I don't actually have any that are not overpowered by mine, so that's good. But it gives you a couple different things, like you get line graphs. You can always also see which channels are the best to choose. And you even have a bar meter, which kind of looks like what that heat map is. But you just focus on one and walk around doing it. So, Right. With this heat mapper software, basically what you would do is install it on your laptop and walk around a particular site. Um, to survey the site and it'll actually populate um, you know what type of access points you have um, and then um, um, uh, put them on on the map so you can see where your access points are on the map as well as your your wireless coverage it's a, a really cool tool um, pretty sure it's free uh, I know they have a free version I don't know if there's a paid version or not but it's a very useful tool. And Glenn says the, the biggest issue with these tools and directional aerials on notebooks and absorption by the user, which that's with that channel, finding out what the best channel is. If you have your Wi-Fi on, your Wi-Fi is taking up one of those channels. So it may be that you're actually on the best Wi-Fi channel but you don't know it because the tool says a different channel is better. And then you switch to that channel, and then it'll say a different channel is better. So. Gotcha. Um, here's the emulator site that I really liked. And basically, this gives you the big ones and gives you a, a login page. So it's like you're logging into that router, and you can see all the settings and different options they have. Um, I found that really helpful in remote <coughs> if I was trying to help someone walk through configuring their router or making a change in their router. That was an awesome site for that. Kind of on the same note, there was also this place called Chasms that let you do it for different versions of Windows and Mac and Ubuntu and tablets and specific browsers. And they have some routers, smartphones, and all kinds of stuff. I really like that site, especially if you do remote support. It helps out a ton to be able to see what they're supposed to be seeing to walk them through doing Heck that yeah. stuff. How, how up to date is it? Uh, when I was using it, very up to date. <laughs> I mean, they have Windows 10 up there. Looks like they got the latest OS X up there. Latest Ubuntu. Latest iPhone. Um, that's actually the one that I used probably the most was the iOS emulators because iOS people need the most help remotely, it seemed. <laughs> I'm trying to see if there's yeah there was another place called uh, Zen Support, and they kind of gave you a different route of doing it. So two different places you can check out for those, and they they both have routers and wireless adapters, <coughs> and different things. So with one of those three, you'll probably come across the product that you're working with or looking at. So oh, those are some good links. Yeah. Yeah, they were very, very helpful. Extremely helpful for remote support stuff. I don't hear the, the echo on the show broadcast, so 
must just be me for some reason. <laughs> uh, Michael had pointed out a, a brand of wireless access points called um, Unify. Um, that was from Linksys. Link what, Brantley? Was that from Linksys or is it actual brand is Unify? It's not Linksys. I haven't heard of them before. Yeah, I'd not heard of them before either. <clears throat> um, but they have um, technology uh, similar to the the Cisco uh, software that um, um, where the access points are able to to communicate with each other about the the, the layout to provide a better coverage with multiple access points. Have you ever used the the power line repeaters? I have not. I'm a stickler for high performance, and from what I've heard, they have a you know a much lower performance than you know copper you know Cat five or Cat five or six cable. Yeah, but I mean that if you don't have the option to run cable, like especially in uh, older houses that have like mesh walls behind their drywall and things like that. So their each room is basically like a Faraday cage. Um, I had set up one of them before and it was in a large house that was like that. It was built back in the day and basically anywhere you put the wireless router, the only place you can get signal was in that room. Hmm. and maybe just outside the door, but otherwise it had to have a repeater in each room. And it was actually more economical for them to have the router in the main location because they did a work from home for one of the adults that was living there. So they got the router there and they direct connected and then had another LAN going into the base power unit which plugs into an electric socket and then you buy uh, add-on units that you just go plug into another socket and it sends the data through the electrical wiring and if Michael's headset was charged I'm sure he could tell you about all about how fun electrical signals are <laughs> he apparently has internet issues because his house isn't grounded And he's building up charge on his internet connection or cable wire or something like that. Who knows? Sounds serious. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, as far as repeaters go and for in the house, I do want to go ahead and promote the Asus routers. They make it extremely easy to set up a repeater. Um, Basically, when you set up the router, you get a interface that you can select access point, repeater, or uh, uh, media bridge, I think. Oh, no. You can select router, repeater, or access point. So router makes it a fully functional router. Repeater makes it so you can connect to a wireless and then it repeats that signal. And then access point gives you all the LAN ports and the WAN acts as a LAN port and it just broadcasts wireless. So, And Glenn agrees, ASUS are fantastic. Yeah, I like their, their firmware a lot. Yeah. He also said, house not grounded sounds like a lightning target. <laughs> and apparently he says he has some issues getting ASUS routers in Australia. That's interesting. Hmm. <clears throat> Michael, I know your headset's charged. It's been 22 minutes since you dropped out. He left to answer the phone. Oh. That's what he says. No, it rang on my side. 
Um, so what else we got on wireless technologies? I know if Nick was here, which he's got an appointment, so that's why he's not with us today, but he would say, don't use Netgear. <laughs> not fond of that. Um, I've had pretty good service out of Netgear routers and access points over the years. You know, I used to. I used to have really good service with them, but I uh, went with a D-Link because there was one on sale and it was cheap and was able to confirmed that it worked with W or DDWRT, so I wanted to play around with that. And then uh, I got an Asus because it was also cheap and on a deal and end up finding that I loved it way more than the, the D-Link because the D-Link was just not providing the coverage that I was expecting from the router at that price point. And or the original retail price point, not the price point I paid for it. And so I went with the Asus, and really I fell in love with the Asus because of the interface was so fantastic, and the coverage was good for the price point of the retail pricing. So I've uh, since gotten a better one, and it's even better, especially now since I can use the other one as a repeater. It just works out great all around. And, yeah, Netgear was a, a story. Michael recommended Netgear to Nick, and it has not been good for Nick. So, <laughs> What did he have, the, the Nighthawk? Yeah, the Netgear Nighthawk. It's supposed to be one of their top-of-the-line ones, and it does not act like it. So he is very upset about that. <laughs> yeah, they were on sale on Black Friday, and I... You know, thought about getting one, but I remember what Nick said about him, so I passed it up. Yeah. Um, the Asus ones for under a hundred bucks, you can get a pretty decent one with AC and all of that. It's not tri-band, which I think that's what his was, but it's I'm pretty sure it's dual band. So, what what are your thoughts on that? When I was looking around. Um, I had heard mixed theories on uh, naming your 5 gigahertz and your 2.4 gigahertz differently. So, like, I wanted to confirm those mixed theories I heard and searched around and found that it was actually recommended that you name them all the same SSID. Really? I thought I thought you need you you needed to to name them something different. Uh, I mean, you don't have to apparently. And, uh, yeah, Glenn, don't get a Nighthawk for your son. Go for Asus. If you need, we can order you one and then ship it to you. It'll just be a little bit more expensive that route. <laughs> um, and I don't know if maybe that would cause custom problems or something. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Um, uh, one router probably wouldn't be an issue. <clears throat> If you start yeah, trying to bring a bunch of them in there, that'd probably be an issue. I won't be sending you a whole case of them. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we can't but, open up the ASUS store. Yeah, but yeah, the the documentation that I was reading and I found it from several sources. Is they said they preferred to set all of their SSIDs and bands to the same SSID and just let the device figure it out. Um, if the device can connect to 5 gigahertz, they normally found it would connect to the 5 gigahertz first and get the higher speeds there. But I've also heard of issues with uh, not having multiple devices. Like I think Nick said he had found some research that really you want to have one device on your 5 gigahertz and if you have multiple bands, that's what the multiple bands are for, is to have one device on each of your bands. So really it's made for 
media devices like your smart TVs and things, you want to have that smart TV connected to one band. Maybe your Xbox connected to a different band and maybe some other media device connected to the other band if you have a tri-band or things like that. So, What do you do? I have I have four, four TVs in my house, four smart TVs. Yeah. I mean, and I... I guess you just have to get another access point to I guess so. <laughs> um, but I so far I haven't had any issues. I've got our phones connected to the five gigahertz and I have uh Johnny's laptop connected to the five gigahertz and we haven't seemed to have any connectivity troubles and we all get fairly fast bandwidth on them, so and it, it's a huge increase on your your bandwidth because 2.4 uh usually you're going to be limited to 20 to 40 megabits per second where connecting to the five gigabits i can get up to the 50 60 megabit range which is the max for my internet connection so and that is those extra 10 20 megabits make a big difference. But the 5 gigahertz is also a, a smaller range, so that's something else to keep in mind. Mm. Yeah, a shorter range, is that what you said? Yeah. Because uh, 2.4 gigahertz will travel further, less encumbered. But you have a lot more devices that can interfere with 2.4 gigahertz, so that's something else to keep in mind. Um, microwaves operate on 2.4 gigahertz. These things are operating on 2.4 gigahertz. I think that um, was one of the main reasons for going to 5 gigahertz. Is that right? Probably. Interoperability with other devices. Yeah. Um, Bluetooth operates on 2.4 gigahertz. So all of those things have issues. And that's one of my biggest gripes with the laptops and things coming out with integrated uh, Bluetooth wireless chipsets. Um, actually, on my Surface, I had the issue where I would connect it to a Bluetooth speaker and my wireless speed would drop in half if I had the Bluetooth speaker sitting right beside the surface. So. Dang. Yeah. So big problems with that. So what kind of wireless setups have you done, Proctor? Uh, I haven't totally set up any, you know, extremely large ones, but I've uh, um, helped set up uh, uh, a lab for BASF in Charlotte. Um, I think they had 15 WAPs in the lab and then probably a dozen or so in the office, and then the two buildings were connected via fiber. Nice. Um, they were actually controlled via a, 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 um, a um, wireless controller that was off-site. Huh. Uh, that's something I haven't played around with is a wireless controller. What can you tell? I, I haven't played around with the one either. Uh, they're extremely expensive, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe up to $100,000. What do you know the theory behind them or what they do? Um, they basically do. Um, I, I don't know that everything about them, but uh, basically they work like this um, scaled down Cisco technology um, to um, um, work with the access points so that they don't inter the channels don't interfere uh, to allow for the the best range of coverage, um, but where the 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 lower end Cisco software only works, I think, with up to five access points. Uh, I think you're pretty unlimited when you're when you're using a wireless controller. But for tens of thousands of dollars, I better be. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, the largest site I've ever set up has probably been maybe three times the size of a regular residential, and they only needed two access points, one at each end, and it covered everything that was needed covered. So, One of the common um, <clears throat> um, type of sites that I've seen that, that would utilize the multiple access points are warehouses. Uh, I a lot of warehouses so. that um, you know they either need to you know, improve their wireless coverage, uh, they have dead spots, or uh, just need to you know get better coverage in a, in a warehouse area. Mm -hmm. Can definitely understand the need for that large spaces like that. Yeah, large spaces, and then you have you know the materials in the way, so you have a lot of obstructions and. <clears throat> You have to work around all those things. What's your opinion on uh, the positioning of your antennas? Um, I have always heard that they should be straight up. So that's something else when I was reading on the SSID stuff that uh, a lot of people were uh, saying that you should have one up and one perpendicular. And the reason for that is especially if you have a mixed environment with a lot of uh, tablets and mobile devices and laptops and things, like laptops probably it's more true that it should be straight up because they're in usually in the screen bezels, so the screen bezel is going to be up. But with your phones and stuff, you change orientation of them so you never know where your wireless antenna is and if it's laying on its side it would actually get better signal from an antenna that's laying on its side because you want to have an antenna that matches the orientation of your receiving antenna yeah here's a life hacker article that pretty much says the same thing you just said yeah and I, I think that's becoming more prevalent with the introduction of all the mobile devices and tablets that you change orientation on quickly and easily. Whereas prior when wireless was first coming out that straight up was probably the standard because you didn't have orientation being changed. Like if you put an external wireless card in your desktop you would by default always have your antenna sitting straight up right and Glenn actually said there's a 3 to 10 decibel loss between vertical and horizontal polarization now Glenn do you mean that if you have them both standing up and you have a horizontal receiving antenna that that's where you lose or you lose from having the antennas like that I think you mean having the horizontal one not in line with the two vertical ones, but yeah. Yeah, so if you have it positioned like this, you can gain three to ten uh, decibels of wireless, he's saying, so definitely would be helpful. And I had always kind of thought that you wanted to have it directionalized as to where you wanted your signal to go, and apparently that's not true at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that at one point. What What do you feel on the height regulation? I had heard that, or my recent research had shown that it is better to have your router in a higher location, like on a bookshelf or something to that effect versus having it lower where that would that seem is. to make sense to me uh, it would seem like you're opening up your field of range yeah avoiding all of your interference in the eye level saw type thing I don't do that I just get a repeater and extend the range <laughs> 
which Proctor also mentioned too that if you're doing a repeater you do lose some range on your original access point because of the interference of having a second one and having to have it in range to be able to connect it's going to have to overlap in areas so and you also may lose some bandwidth yeah and having additional hops going over a wireless so if you're connected to a repeater you have to remember that you're wirelessly transmitting to a device that's also wirelessly transmitting to another device that's then connected to a LAN that's then connected to a modem that then is going out so that's something I would said is I probably wouldn't try to go one repeater out or more than one repeater out without having a another wired access point beyond that and then repeating that out in that direction and doing that in a directional basis because having too many hops without a LAN connection I feel is where you're going to end up losing your bandwidth the most and don't skimp out on your repeater you might actually want to spend more on your repeater than you did the actual access point because there are ones that do seriously cut your bandwidth in half because it is receiving and transmitting on the same chipset antenna as it is connecting to the access point where you would really want to have two chipsets one handling your clients and one handling the connection oh that's something interesting we can talk about the uh, Wi-Fi pineapple is actually a extremely good uh, repeater because it does have two chipsets in it cool yes this little hacking device I could actually set up as a wireless repeater and what's even cooler is I could set it up as a wireless repeater on a battery pack so if I just temporarily needed to extend my wireless I'd be able to set it up in that manner but this has two chipsets so each of these antennas is actually working on its own chipset so I could have this one connecting to the wireless and then this one handling the clients and then I don't lose any bandwidth that way you still have the extra time hop but not that bad it's a pretty cost-effective way to do it too just a little time to set it up mm -hmm. It would take a little configuring because that's not what it's designed for but that's the nice thing about this is is ex extremely configurable and a fairly good price point for hundred dollars for a repeater that's about average if not a little bit under the extremely good ones or at least when I was heavily looking into repeaters yeah I think a hundred bucks is about the average Jeez, what is Johnny doing in there? She reformat her computer. She needs the Wi-Fi password. Mm. <laughs> ho ho ho! What if I did? Format your computer. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty extreme for an audio issue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know I'd say that's a, a default answer for Michael, but. Don't judge me. Mm. Well, that pretty much covers what I what I wanted to go over as far as the access points are concerned. Yeah, that was good stuff. I liked it. It went a little faster than I was expecting. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any other topics we can cover on just Wi-Fi in general. 
we'll just go through some good uh, practices as far as setting up your security. Oh yeah, there's nothing other than WPA AES. Don't do TKP, TKIP. Definitely don't do WEP. Don't do WPA one. And definitely don't run with no security at all. Heck no. <laughs> Actually, my uh, the office next door to me is uh, has an unsecured Wi-Fi. Uh, you need to. I've offered, get to, off. I've, I've offered, <laughs> offered to change it for them, but they, they haven't taken me up on the offer yet. Um, Lifehacker had a pretty good one. Yeah, oh, they I got. Pasted one, I pasted one in the chat too. Yeah, I saw that one. Uh, Lifehacker had a pretty good one about some of the good things to do. Um, updating your firmware regularly. If you have a year to two year old router, they're probably still coming out with firmware updates for it. Definitely would be good. Yeah, Glenn, if you have a open wireless, you definitely have people leeching off your internet. It's almost a fact. And if you have people sitting outside your house for prolonged periods of time, you know what they're doing. You wanna make sure remote administration's off, definitely do that. Disabling universal plug and play if you don't need it. I know things like Xbox and other things do need it, so some cases you can't turn that off. Um, definitely turn off WPS. That is the largest security risk out there. Um, so basically WPS is just a six digit pen code and that's, and what WPS is, is Wi-Fi protected setup. And essentially you push a button on your, yep, you push a button on your router and then you click your device and it sets up the connection without you having to put in a password. But if you do that, then you have that enabled there's only so many uh, combinations of a six digit pen code and that is actually the easiest way to hack a wireless uh, secured wireless router nowadays is uh, there's something called a pixie dust attack I think it is and one other thing but yeah that's definitely something that you want to disable there um, that was not the right thing. Dang it. Anyway, um, I was talking away and my mic was muted. <laughs> um, the diagram I'm, I'm showing you now uh, was just saying that the, the location of the router in your house, if it's a home or even office, can have a lot to do with your, your coverage area. You can see here they're, they have the, um, the router in the bottom corner of their living room and they're not getting access in their bedroom. So if you can move that you know, more to the centralized location, uh, that would probably help your coverage. I mean, like things like chimneys and you know stuff like that can can affect the the signal strength as well. Um, but what I've found is a lot of people just stick their router right next to their DSL modem, uh, you know, wherever their internet comes into their house, and don't think much about where their router is located. And that can have a lot to do with uh, getting a good signal throughout your home. So what the deuce? I so my untangle router the MSATA drive that I have in there died during a power outage so I got a replacement one 
and I got a Kingston uh, 60 gig MSATA one. Amazon apparently sent me a Kingston 8 gigabyte RAM chip instead. <laughs> And it says Apple equivalent on there. Not at all what I ordered. That's the first time Amazon has ever messed up for me. I'm going to have to yell at them or something. Hey, it says Kingston on it. Yeah, they got one thing right. <laughs> You had one of 10,000 jobs. <laughs> oh, that's not good. They have a option for wrong item sent. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> their returns. Apparently this happens often. Yeah, and then Apple's weird stuff, as he says. Glenn says in the chat. Yes, they are. This is why I disable notifications, because they randomly talk about weird things in our office chat. Um, yeah, one of the other things they said in there was the possibility of doing hiding your SSID and also doing MAC address filtering. And really those things are kind of mute points, I would say. Um, they don't really protect you that much. Uh, basically, the way wireless works is you can see what MAC addresses are connected to a wireless access point. So it's easy to uh, fake those on your device and then easily connect to it. So definitely do not use that as your only security. It definitely helps obscure it some more, and you have to have someone that actually knows what they're doing to get into it. or knows a little bit more about what they're doing, but definitely is not a security measure. And the hiding SSID, that is just actually more aggravating than it is anything else. Uh, hiding SSID just means you have to type your SSID and your password in to all of your devices you want to connect. It really doesn't hide anything, um, especially if someone is trying to break into it. it makes it extremely non, non point and if anything makes your network look more attractive to an attacker because they're wondering why you're hiding it. And Glenn posted a link in here saying uh, for after the session and it says, if you Luke, Father West, if you're Wookiee, today's Star Wars weather. Seems like it'll be an interesting video. Thank you, Glenn. Um, Yeah, John is just posting, or Nick is just posting random emoticons into our office chat. Kind of weird. And yeah. yeah, Glenn agrees that hiding SSIDs is annoying. It most certainly is. Uh, that is not where I meant to type that. Yes, that is the dinging you're hearing. I imagine you're hearing it from proctors. Could be.
Um, <clears throat> hey, Michael. Yeah, hey. Can, you guys can hear me now again. Um, that's finally um, back. Um, and that's today's show, people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, no. The the they they came to my house and uh, yeah, there's it's not Are grounded they taking at you all. Away? Well, no, the electrician came is what okay. I meant to say. Um, and and the house isn't grounded at all, so um, there's just no ground um, at all. Um, so whatever wire, um, the cable one that they just uh, uh, the early, you know a year ago that they buried uh, from the pole to my house, um, that is my only house's ground, and so all the electricity, the air to juice in the house is going out the path of least resistance, which happens to be my cable line. Mm. So, um, yeah, I've got some serious problems, and apparently uh, it's not that easy to just ground a whole house that I thought. No, that is not easy at all. Um, something involving burying metal shunts or something I, I don't know um, and, and gr uh, ground rods ground rods yes that's what they said um, and uh, yeah connecting that um, but you can do that have fun with that well the guys were scared the experienced guys that were just here they seem to be incredibly worried about that the cost primarily of what that would entail so much so that they couldn't even give me a ballpark. Glenn, Glenn mentioned in the chat the solution to the Win 10 issue factory restore. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. I, I did read back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, and uh, thanks for, for following up. Um, it's good to uh, know, um, but uh, I thought it was um, I thought it was a you know I thought it was because of Win 10. The, the November update, I didn't realize it was a machine that already had significant problems and, you know, and it had a failing hard drive too. So the went system 32 folder not being there is yeah. Going to be consistent with all that stuff. Um, but anyway, I've had a ton of bad news guys, you know, about my roof getting replaced. Um, you know, I overspent my budget on the computers that I needed and uh, now I'm hit with a, what's more than likely going to be a multi-thousand dollar, um, you know, uh, electric electrical bill. Oh, I'll be eating, um, I don't know what for the holidays. Something and ramen cheap. noodles taste good. Yeah, ramen's always handy. <laughs> Too bad they don't make a turkey flavor. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, you have to sell for chicken. chicken though. The Campbell's soup have a entirely new line at Walmart. You can get lots of different flavors for dollar twenty five a meal. It's good. Mm. I like it at least. Johnny is not a big fan of it. Where were the oh, days when you used to be able to get a whole meal for ten cents? Ramen noodles. That's Where good. were you ever able to do that? Ramen, back when I was in college, you could do that. Now you got to spend something like 20 cents for ramen. Oh, oh my God. Oh, here's an, uh, on that Lifehacker article, they also said that uh, another option would be uh, setting static IP addresses. Uh, so essentially there you turn off the DHCP server on your router and then have your router set to a strange, obviously not the 192.168.0. Or, or one dot or your standard ones, just pick a random set of numbers there. Then uh, making all your devices uh, static IPs. So that's, that's actually a pretty good uh, route to protect your stuff. What are y'all's opinions on that? Uh, it sounds sounds like it was it's a good way to secure the network. Um, it's a little inconvenient, especially if you want to have you know be able to add devices easily. Yeah. Or if you're not you know at home and you have guests coming over and they want to hop on your Wi-Fi and 
And you have to go a static IP on your stack. iPhone. And you have to remember that to to disable that when they leave. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons it is really good, though, is that is something you're not able to tell from the wireless connection. So yeah. if you're sniffing Wi-Fi and you crack it and get into the Wi-Fi, if you don't know the LAN address or subnet even, yeah, you're pretty much out of luck except for trying the uh, few <laughs> thousand that there are. Trial and error. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is a lot of IP, and that that actually probably would be the last option on my mind as to why I wasn't able to connect. I would have thought it would be something else if I was trying to break into a network like that. Yeah, it was not something you normally think of. No, not at all. And yet it would be highly secure. It's excellent. I'm glad I read to the end of that article. <laughs> Yeah, Michael, you didn't have your roofers install a lightning rod? No, no lightning rods because all that would have done is bring – I mean, without a <laughs> ground, do you know what happens? That's not going to be good. Well, no, you ground the lightning rod on its own. You don't use your ground in your house for that. I mean, you could, but, I mean, why would you? I don't know. I, I just – I, I I don't want my new computer to be fried, okay? And I'm setting it up in this house, and yeah, granted, it'll be behind the EPS, but uh, I, I I don't want to risk uh, these types of things, and I, I don't need my internet going out, and I don't well, no, need I'm, TV I'm to be unwatchable if I'm paying for it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't get your house grounded. You definitely should do that. My mom's house went ungrounded for a long time. She just recently got it grounded. How much does that cost her? A ton. That's why a she didn't give me a, a ton. <laughs> what? What's a ton? A ton's thousands. Two thousand. Thousands yeah. So uh, literally a ton. Oh, this, this whole, I didn't um, know I would spend fifteen thousand dollars on a roof and a, electricity. The uh, the we knew the house wasn't really grounded because none of the outlets were three prong. They were all. No, I knew I had to replace all the two prongs out with the, with three pronged outlets. I thought that was sufficient to ground the house. It wasn't. No, because the. The, what did you connect the ground of those three prongs to? Did you just close, replace the outlets? The closest metal I could find. You, you just no, That's not how that works. <laughs> the metal you attach it to would have to be grounded. Yeah. I thought something in my house was grounded. I Apparently not. That, that, that do, you have metal, do you have metal plumbing? Metal only really works in cars, Michael. Oh. Oh. So, yeah, what about what, what, plumbing? What about the plumbing metal? Do you have metal plumbing? Yes, I do. Mostly. Grounded on that. Oh, wait. Yeah. Mostly. Just be careful when you sit down on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Hope the light. Don't do it during a lightning storm with that lightning rod attached there, too. <laughs> oh, oh, imagine the horror. I think you're having a bad day now. <laughs> 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 oh, oh so, so you had two prong outlets, Michael, and you replaced them with three prong outlets. Yes. Glenn, actually, I didn't personally replace them. I had somebody else come and replace them, but apparently that's all they did was they 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 took the the two prongs out and put in three. Apparently, yeah. Glenn says very sternly, "No, no, not to the plumbing, never." <laughs> <laughs> he would be correct. I agree with I agree with Glenn. That's water and electricity are. Yeah, <laughs> terrible and idea. But the metal will ground it, will it not? Yes, Michael, it will. Michael, it's going to reroute it back to your house. It's going to follow water. Anytime you run a faucet, it's going to come up through your sink and anywhere, dude. That doesn't sound safe. Yeah, it does. Uh -huh. That's why you don't do it. 
<laughs> well, but how do I get around spending this exorbitant amount of money to get this thing resolved? You do it yourself. Buy yeah, some books. Yeah, you do it yourself. You, 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 you pull the wire from the from your electrical outlets not... back to the electrical panel, connect it into the grounding bar in the electrical panel if you have a grounding bar in the electrical panel. Well, that's the problem. If not, get, an <laughs> electrical panel. Get, get an earth stake, as Glenn suggested. You do have an electrical panel. That You do definitely have that. I do have a panel. I yes, do have an electrical yeah. panel, but I don't have a ground connected to it. Well, you can get an earth stake and ground it. And then you just run a ground wire from each of those locations. You have to make sure of how much current you're going to be pushing through those and get the appropriate size uh, wiring to be able to handle more than what you're going to probably be pushing through it. So there's a lot of equations that you have to take into effect, but you oh, can learn them all. Shit. Or you can just pay someone else a ton and they'll do it for you. Hello. Here's Hello. a link for you, Michael. Is that electricals for dummies? It was ehow.com. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> One of our tech shows will be the memorial for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I wired my house to the toilet, and all I got was this lousy <laughs> casket. <laughs> my packing tape. Johnny, do you know where the packing tape is? Absolutely in here. Absolutely in there. Excellent. And my scissors. She just growled at you. Packing tape is right there. What do you need scissors for? We've made it through our show today. And longer. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Packing tape and gerbils. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Just to let everyone know, Michael did not get electrocuted. <laughs> Yet. Yeah. We'll wait and see what the results are of his e or his ehal.com. Um, but yeah, we'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us at foolishtechshow.com or foolishit.com slash live. You can jump in our IRC chat. Somebody's normally hanging around in there. Um, might not pay immediate attention to it, but we will at least talk about it on the next show airing. So check it out there. Otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, all the links should be in the description. And we will see you all tomorrow. And if you have any questions about support or our products, definitely feel free to ask because that's why we're here. Otherwise, we're just going to talk about random things. So if you want to end it, Proctor, you take it away, sir. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I uh, hope you learned something about uh, setting up wireless access points. Um, please join us tomorrow Brownie. for our show at 6 p.m. I already said all that. I just meant hit the broadcast button. <laughs> <laughs> he did, yeah, he did say that. <laughs>